So the question is, how culturally relevant are you? How culturally relevant are you? Or are you just kind of one of these quirkies, going against the grain, you want to be heard, you've got a whole load of stuff to say, you've got a whole load of noise to make, and you're saying it a little bit too loud. <laughs> All right, come on. If we look around um, social media land today, online land, um, there's a whole lot of noise going on out there in the tinternet, isn't there? A whole load of people with a whole load of stuff to say. Um, kind of makes it quite hard to find and come across those individuals who actually have something sensible to say. So think about the words that commonly come out of your mouth. Are your words sensible? Are they value adding? Are they building people up? Or are they just detracting from people's lives or undermining your culture? Or are you critical of people, critical of yourself, critical of your culture, critical of your government, critical of religion, undermining of the beliefs and the views that your country was founded upon? I think I mentioned in that last, in that last video, um, it's really interesting. When we take a little bit of time to study um, the history of our culture and you know, having, I actually, when I went through, uh, I studied, spent a couple of years studying the social sciences years ago, and uh, two of the projects that I kind of committed to, studying the history of Scotland and also the history of America, um, which was fascinating. You know, going, going back to the Founding Fathers, um, you know, the, uh, the independence, all that sort of thing, independence breaking free from... Um, from, from UK, from Britain's law and monarchical rule and all that sort of thing. And you understand it. Like, it's understandable, right? People driven by freedom, all right? Um, America founded upon some virtuous values. Um, exploration, freedom, uh, cooperation, integrity, justice, right? Those are the founding values of the United States of America. Then turn on your social media, look at the videos, look at what people are advocating, all right? Uh, one little idea, and I'm, I'm not a religious man, but it's, it's an interesting idea to consider, all right? Atheism's become such a big thing. You know, I don't believe in this, I don't believe in that, I debate this and I debate that. Right, tell that to your founding forefathers <laughs> of America who say, in God we trust. The only reason so many people have the freedom and the liberty to express their opinion, freedom of speech, is because of the values that the generations of yesteryear committed to. And this is a really, it's a really important idea to get a heads around because sometimes we'll prioritize our own opinions, voicing our own opinions may or may not be based on any substance whatsoever, we end up undermining our cultural values in the process. And when this happens, some people deem themselves as being completely culturally irrelevant, right? So are you culturally relevant or are you culturally irrelevant? Just look at the quality of your relationships. Look at how seriously the majority of people that you know take you. Are people flocking to spend time with you or are they not? You might have a little bit of security in a little social group or a circle or something like this, but seriously, does society at large find any value in you? Yes or no? Or are you just adding to the noise? Does society at large find any value in you or do you just add to the noise? Unless, of course, going back to that personality model, you're unsociable and reserved and quiet, in which case society probably doesn't even notice you. <laughs> But likewise, whether you're making too much noise or no noise at all, is it valuable noise? Is it adding value to people's lives? Is it sensible? Is it capturing people's attention? Are you winning friends or are you just alienating yourself? All right, these are the questions that we need to ask. So let me tell you a story. And this, I love this story. I, I've told this story probably a thousand times over the last decade. I love it. It's relevant for every single one of us. And this story comes from a book called The Republic that was written by Plato, this handsome fellow here, thousands of years ago. He was one of the um, uh, late great philosophers of the, of the Grecian Empire. So he wrote a book called The Republic, which is essentially just a book. Um, it's a story of a few conversations that were had between a teacher and student. Right? 
Um, and he, he tells the story of a cave. And this story of the cave kind of paints a picture of how it is that many people live their lives. But it also paints a picture on how it is that some individuals who are kind of a little bit tired of the status quo can, can change things if they want to. How some people can break apart from the status quo and be different. How some people can rise up. All right, so some people view it as a story of inspiration, some as a story of hope, others as a story of validation. Yes, that's me, that's where I'm staying. So let me tell you the story. There was a cave, and in this cave, there were a community of dwellers, right? a community of people who'd been there from birth, and they spent their days looking at a light on the back of the cave, which was just a, just a reflection, all right, a reflected light. And um, what they look at are just kind of shadows, silhouettes on the wall. Now, the thing is, the people in the cave um, don't know that what they're looking at are just shadows and silhouettes. We know, because we understand that um, the light and shadow is just a reflection of other real things, but they don't know this because it's all that they know. So from their perspective and from their cultural background, they assume that what they're looking at are real things. They even have names for these real things that their uh, monster, ghost, angel, demon, god, titan, so on and so forth. So they have names for all these things. That one there is actually a mental disorder. So as they're all sitting there, um, they're bound to the, to the floor by shackles around their wrists and around their ankles. But remember, they've been there for years. So one of the men in the cave who's been there for years, he kind of... He goes to yawn <sighs> one day and his shackles break loose because the metal's all rusty and, and he thinks to himself, hmm, something's changed. I don't have to look in this direction anymore. In the past I didn't have any choice, but now I, now I do. What shall I do with this newfound freedom? Shall I do nothing with it? Shall I just stay the same or shall I look around? So he decided to use his newfound freedom to unshackle his ankles and he stood up and he kind of started looking around the cave and what he realised as he looked behind him which he'd, done for the, which he'd never done before was that there was a wall behind where the dwellers were all sitting and behind this wall there was like a big blazing furnace and it, you could see that it was this furnace that was casting light onto the wall and kind of onto this back wall of the cave but, but behind this wall behind the cave dwellers there were a bunch of puppeteers who were marching up and down with kind of sticks in their hands with little carved models on the end of them. So where all of these people had genuinely believed they were looking at real things their whole life, this now new free and liberated man was able to identify that what I'm looking at actually is the real thing that is casting shadows and silhouettes onto the wall, so that's not even real. What I thought was real wasn't real anymore. Now I can see what's real. Can you imagine how confused he was or how liberated he became? He, he would have become enlightened, wow. It's kind of like my whole life I was blind, but now I can see, now I can see clearly. I can see the true nature of reality. All he had before was his perception. So as he kept on, he kept on looking around, but two of the guards in the cave had come to realise that he'd broken free. So they quickly grabbed him and they took him up some steps and they chucked him out of the cave. So now the guy's completely outside of the cave, right? This has just become a long distant memory. As he's outside the cave, it kind of took him around about 20 minutes for his eyes to adjust because he was confronted with daylight. He'd spent his whole life in a cave. So now he's looking at daylight, there's the sun up there, there's fields over there, there's a city over there, there's like a motorway with cars driving up and down. He didn't have names for any of these things. It was just, he'd never experienced it before. So, yeah. so he spent a couple of weeks walking around and he started putting names on, on, on new things. This is a car. This is a house. This is a feeling. This is a field. That's the sun. That's a tree. And he started naming all these things. Until one day he realised, oh, what about the old community that I've left behind? 
oh, they don't, they're, they're, they're no wiser. Because as he was outside the cave, he could realize that all these things that had been carved, that these puppeteers were carrying up and down behind this wall, they were like just carvings of real things. So he's kind of come through three levels of awakening, if you like. The awakening that allowed him to identify that what he'd spent his whole life looking at wasn't real. Then the second awakening, realizing that those things behind that wall that all those puppeteers were car carrying, those things also weren't real things. They were just things that were kind of carvings off real, real things outside of the cave in this real world. And his eyes were now open. So what he'd done in a really sneaky way was he went and took a communication skills course and he learned how to kind of, you know, ask open questions and use tonality and, um, you know, just use a few persuasion techniques. And he sneaked back into the cave, sat back down amongst his old community. And he had a haircut because all these guys had like long hair. So he'd gone for like a high and tight, short back and sides. And he would kind of um, decided that he wasn't quite sure, um, you know, what sort of dress could he wanted to go for? So he went for a nice polka dot shirt and and a, fl and a florally dress because these days that's kind of what what some people do. So he decided this is how I want to dress. He went back into his old culture, and he said, "Listen, see what you're looking at. Everything you think is real, none of it is. None of it's real. You're deceived. You're deluded. Everything you think you're looking at just." isn't a real thing. It's just a reflection of some carved things that are getting carried up and down this wall behind you, which you can't even see. And you think you're looking at real light on that back wall of the cave. That's not even real light. It's just like fire, this light that man maketh, which isn't even real fire either. It's just a real, real light. Um, it's kind of like just light that comes and goes. Um, but outside of this cave, and I know that you don't even know you're in a cave, uh, outside there's like a real world. And there's cars and buses and clothes shops and dresses and men and women. And then there's boys and girls and cows and dogs and cats and all these things that you've never experienced before. And look at me. Look, uh, look how liberated I am. And the guy's wearing his polka dot shirt and florally dressed because it's just a quirky thing to do these days. And he sits back in his cave amongst all his old people. How do you think they respond? Hey, Fred, he's left the cave. And look what's happened to him. He's gone all weird on us. Let us make sure that we never, ever leave this cave. We don't want to turn out like him. So tell the story more than anything else. Um, to highlight the importance of, you've taken this course. Granted, you've most likely had a few realizations, a few aha moments. Um, but don't lose your cultural relevance. Don't matter, it doesn't matter how much you grow, doesn't matter how much you realise, doesn't matter how much you want to change. Just understand that other people out there can only handle so much change at any one given moment in time. So you might get a, 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 um, a taste for rapid change, and that's fine, right? You should change as much about your life as what you want to, as what you need to. But remember that not all other people will be as ready to change, or as eager to change, or as quick to change which just means that when we're interacting with people, we've sometimes just got to be prepared to be patient, compassion, it's just love people where they're at and acknowledge that everyone is just at their own place on their own journey. <laughs> Master your emotions and revolutionize your social skills. <laughs>